Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Thank you for coming along with chat today. I'm sorry I've been up a bit of this because uh, it's a weird setup here. But, um, my name is Sven Hansen. I'm uh, one of the sales consultants at Redify. And um, we're here today to talk about a, a cross platform um, uh, or developing mobile apps on cross platform. Um, a little bit about Redify for those of you who don't know. Um, Redify has been around since about 2001. Uh, we've got um, around about 200 consultants with offices in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Um, we've got about 45 consultants here in, in, in um, Brisbane. Um, in short, Redify, we, we help customers solve really complex business problems. It's kind of what we do. Uh, and we do that through technology and, and awesome software solutions. Um, we're, a, we're a very strong Microsoft partner. Um, we're, we're very proud. We got a, a, a couple of very prestigious Microsoft awards um, uh, this year. One was Microsoft Partner of the Year for Australia, and another one which we're very proud of is the uh, Application Lifecycle Management Partner, uh, and that was a global award. Um, so that's kind of a, you know tests our, our, our capability to help clients uh, you know solve, solve problems. Uh, and that, because we're a Microsoft partner, we're obviously very closely aligned with the Microsoft frameworks and tool sets. Um, as well. Um, I'd like to introduce Andrew, uh, Andrew Harcourt. Um, for those of you in the development community, um, or for many of you in the development community, Andrew doesn't need much of a uh, introduction. He's pretty well known. Um, Andrew is one of our principal, for those of you who don't know him, Andrew is one of our principal consultants. Um, Andrew is a, a solution architect and a software engineer and um, he specialises in large-scale, high-load, uh, geographically dispersed uh, distributed systems. Um, and from what I understand, Andrew's been coding in one form or another since he's been about five years old. So uh, uh, wealth of experience and, and knowledge. Time now. And um, we're very, uh, you know, we really value having Andrew uh, at Redify and our clients really value his, his advice and, and uh, help as well. Um, Andrew's also got his own blog at uglybugger.org, so um, I'd highly recommend you. you know um, looking at Andrew's. Uh, he's got some very um, very good points of view about technology and the industry and tools and so forth. So if you're interested, uh, please follow Andrew on, on that. And he's also uh, a, a very keen and and from what I hear, a very good photographer and has his own photography business. So, uh, <laughs> A quick plug for the <laughs> photography business as well. Um, Don't worry, video, we'll cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, with that being said, I'll, I'll hand over to Andrew. Today, as I said, we're going to talk about developing mobile applications on um, cross, cross platform. So, I hope, um, you know, hope it's very interesting for you and, and very relevant. And, um, you know, Andrew and I will hang around sort of at the end as well. So, if you want to ask any questions at the end or, or ask as, as we're going as well. Uh, please feel free to come and see any of us. Okay, thanks very much. Over to you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Sven, for a uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'll, I'll try not to let the side down from, from here. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming out this morning. Uh, I realize it's a very cold morning. Um, so I really appreciate that everyone made the effort to, uh, to actually get out and say hi. Um, I won't shun either side of the room. Uh, I am going to have to direct attention to either one side of the room or the other at a time. That's just the shape of these lecterns. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'll start out shunning you, and I'm really sorry about that. But then I will shun you, and hopefully we'll keep it fairly even. Um, so I guess we're, we're here to discuss uh, cross-platform uh, application development, with a, uh, particularly with a mobile slant, but this also applies to a lesser extent, for just for this morning's content, uh, to a lesser extent to cross-platform app development uh, on, on, on all stacks. But we care most, most, mostly for this morning about mobile. Um, quick agenda for this morning. We're going to have a uh, really quick look at just strategies overall. Uh, you know, what are we actually thinking in the mobile space? Uh, what considerations do we have? Why do we care? Why do we actually need to be mobile? And then, OK, so we've decided that we need to move to be mobile friendly, what do we do? Um, we'll have a look at a couple of different approaches. So we've got the uh, the evolutionary approach versus just big bang. Okay, we need the the big, you know, great whiz bang app, and we need it now. Um, we'll have a look at a couple of decision points. How do I actually make decisions now? This talk is targeted by and large at the people who are going to be making those strategic decisions. This is 
we understand we need some kind of mobility strategy. We understand that we have to spend a kind of you know, a certain amount of budget on it. Uh, how do we actually identify what our goals are? Uh, how do we identify where that budget goes? What strategy do we, do we take? We're not really going to look at tooling. Um, there'll be a few bits on particular tooling as it pertains to the strategy that it enables, but this is not a dev-centric talk. This is very much a strategy-centric talk. That said, if you're only interested in cutting code, you probably still want to be interested in building the right thing with the right tools. So this should still be quite important. Um, the last thing we'll do is we'll have a look at a couple of case studies and um, we'll see how we go. So strategy-wise, what does cross-platform development mean? Because it's not so very long ago that cross-platform meant iPhone 3GS and Android, whatever the latest was. And, and that was it. If you had an app, then you could pretty much just bung it onto one form factor of iPhone. And maybe if you wanted to support the underdog, then you would go and build something for, for Android. Windows Phone, what is it? Um, sorry, Windows Mobile 6.5 was still a thing. It had a really good app ecosystem for, for what it was. And, and that was kind of the lay of the land. And that was it. And it was relatively easy to decide on what your mobile strategy was going to be. Yes or no? If yes, this is what you build for. If no, move on. Um, things are a little bit different now. Um, let's have a look. So what does it actually mean? Right now, the, the biggest issue we have right now, excuse me, biggest issue we have right now is a huge explosion in device form factors. Now have a look at that particular grid there. Um, that's just Android. That's just Android. Not a mention of iOS, not a mention of Windows Phone, that's just your Android different devices. Each of those have slightly different resolutions, slightly different you know, actual screen height and width, which is not resolution. Um, we have so many different devices that we have to support. Um, likewise, if we're looking at just within iOS, okay, well, that's fairly easy. We still probably have to support 3GS, probably. We still have to support 4, which brings us Retina, uh, and then 4S. Thankfully, we got away fairly you know, fairly freely with that because it was the same form factor. iPhone 5, a little bit longer. iPhone 6, a little bit bigger. Ooh, hang on a minute, 6 Plus, now that's another form factor. And then we have iPad, we have all sorts of flavors of iPad, we have the mini, we have this, you know, all those sorts of... Oh, and then we have portrait and landscape. And you'd think that that wouldn't make a huge difference, but it's actually just doubled your workload. Um, this is important. So we have a huge explosion in the form factors we have to care about. Um, likewise. Touch. Touch is a thing. Um, I know, you know App Apple will have you believe that it's not a thing on your laptops, but it is. Everybody else is going there. Uh, I think Apple's one of the last hardware manufacturers that you can't actually buy a touchscreen laptop from. Um, but touch is everywhere. Um, quick show of hands. Who has a child? OK, and keep the hand of shame up. Who has a child with an iPad? <laughs> <laughs> Has your child touched your laptop screen and wondered why it doesn't work? Yeah, the television. <laughs> they touch the TV and it's broken. Right? And who's, who, has anybody not seen the, the little video of the little girl trying to use a paper magazine and just poking at it and poking at it? <laughs> and then she tests her finger on her leg to see if her <laughs> finger is... Right. <laughs> now, that's the expectation. Right? The expectation is that if I can see it, I can interact with it by manipulating it. We're still in our infancy as far as that, I guess, that level of sophistication is concerned. But it's a thing. We're never going back. Touch is everywhere. Um, we then complicate things further by looking at things like with our internal and external users, we have to care about things like authentication. Now, authentication, if you're talking about a public, uh, app, sorry, a public app or a public website, well, that's trivial. You don't have one. Um, you know, this is my company's publicly facing website, and I want as many people as possible to, to go and see that website, so why would I put it behind a, a password? Um, then at the other end of the spectrum, you have credit card payment processes, you have medical records, you have all sorts of things, so you care a huge amount about security, which means you have to, you have, to have different strategies to, to cope with it, whether that's single sign-on for some applications or uh, two-factor authentication for, for others, perhaps even biometric authentication. Hey, look, if I'm looking at my own you know, patient records, um, you know, it won't be too far before we have iris scanners or something in our phones. Right? The cameras aren't quite high enough definition yet, but they're not too far away. 
So then you might be saying, well, okay, I can't actually log into my personal medical records app or my you know, health app or whatever until I actually hold the phone up to my eyeball and the phone actually identifies my iris from my medical records and that's how it shows that it's me. Now, this stuff is coming. Um, it's not there yet, but when we're talking strategy, we have to be aware of what's going to be coming so that we don't get wrong-footed by it. Or at least if we do get wrong-footed, it's not too bad. The elephants in the room are SOE and BYOD. Um, and the variation in, in people's expressions when they say those two acronyms is great because your employees, when they say SOE, say it like that. Whereas your sysadmins and your CTOs and CIOs say SOE and are happy. And then the complete converse, obviously, when employees hear BYOD, they're like, bring my own device, great, I can use whatever I want. And your CIO is going, oh dear. Um, <laughs> there has to be some kind of middle ground. Uh, the middle ground will shift dependent on context. Uh, obviously, if you are a military contractor and you deal with you know, top secret or above, if there is a class classification above it, you know, those kinds of secrets, you will use what you're given and you'll like it. Um, because if you don't, military prisons are apparently not very friendly. Um, likewise, though, if you're building the next great you know, social media sharing app thing, uh, and they say that you have to use this old mainframe when you, you, know, you have your shiny little Surface Pro 3 or whatever, um, that's not going to work well either. Okay? So we have to look at SOE and bring, and bring your own device within the context of what we're actually trying to achieve, the environment that we're operating in, and the, uh, the security constraints that we have. Um, that said, it's also important for the perspective of, well, what do we actually support? If it's an SOE and we can say, all right, it's um, Windows XP, and we're going to have a VB6 app, and everyone will have Windows XP, everyone will have the same screen size. It doesn't matter that your VB6 form designer only caters to one screen size because you only have that one form factor. So why, why, would it be, why, why would there be any pressure to move away from that? And then all of a sudden, you know, Windows, Windows XP's end of life mysteriously creeps up on people somehow. Uh, <laughs> despite years and years and years of, of warning by Microsoft that it was going to be end of life, somehow it creeps up on people. And then we're left in a situation where people have different screen sizes. Oh dear, we're back to form factors again. And we're back to form factors even on desktop apps. So we have to cope with this stuff. Specific to mobile apps, though, the two real, I guess, um, key considerations we have, to tra we have to look at are richness versus reach. And, of course, the third one in the you know, obligatory iron triangle is cost. Okay. So what are we actually talking about when we look at Because rich versus reach is it's, it's a trade that you're going to have to make a lot. It's going to have to be, I guess, front of mind, top, or sorry, top of mind, when you're making your strategic decisions because there are huge cost implications whichever way you go. So, richness. Richness is basically trying to use all of the device's features in the way that they were intended. Uh, when we write a very rich application as far as the device capabilities are concerned, what we're really doing is we're saying, Effectively, put all of the other devices to the side for now. We're focusing on just this one. That means we're going to write it in native code, whether it's Objective-C or Swift or you know, Java for Android or you know, take your pick for, for Windows Phone. Um, but we're going to write it just as a native application. We're going to use all of the really cool device features that are probably the device's selling points. Okay. Hey, you know, this really cool device has near-field communications. Um, we should use that. Or um, you, we've, we've got a particular, I guess, feature that you know, if, if we're actually trying to advertise a device and we've got a particular feature that we want to, to demonstrate to people, we don't want that to be a second class experience. It needs to work. Likewise, if you have a, uh, a very uh, critical audience, so if you're, for instance, building an application that graphic designers and user experience experts are going to use and you're going to sell that to them, it needs to be a very, very high quality application. If you're building an application that many, 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 many people are going to use, then likewise, you're probably going to want to err on the side of richness because just that one niggling little thing multiplied by 300 million people, that's a lot of support calls. That's a lot of angry tweets. That's a lot of people just voting it down 
in your app marketplace or your app store. It's a lot of three stars versus five stars, which punishes you know, your, your search results, you know, your search ranking. Um, when you're going very, very large scale, if you scale up a good thing, you do wonderful things. If you scale up a not so great thing, that's not really all that good an outcome. Um, so things like you know, in-app purchases, for instance, you're not going to be able to make a, a, an Apple you know, App Store purchase from a non-Apple device. That just doesn't work, but you're still going to want people to do it. Likewise, things like um, cloud providers. So um, you, the, the whole like, you know, Microsoft uh, OneDrive sync is actually really quite nice now. Um, doesn't play all that nicely with iCloud, doesn't play all that nicely with Google. Apple and Google don't play nicely with each other. You know, how many lawsuits have they lobbed at each other recently? Um, so when you care about all of those platform-specific things, you really care about richness. You care about really, really tight integration, and it needs to be seamless. If you're shooting for a rich experience, it must be rich, seamless, beautiful. That's what you're shooting for there. By contrast, reach is, I want to get this app in front of as many people as I can without doing too much unnecessary work. Mm -hmm. um, the obvious example of that is a website. You can just write a website, and everybody on the internet can, can see it. You know, people with you know, wind-up phones in the middle of the Sahara can see it, and that's wonderful. Um, just be aware that you're making that trade. You have to make that decision. And I'm not going to advise you this morning on whether you should go for one or the other. Um, that's dependent on, on context. You have to give thought to, well, what problem are we actually solving here? Okay. What's our target market? What are they going to do with this product? How is it going to help them? Um, that's going to give us our position on the, on the continuum. Okay. So again, if you've got a really, really finicky audience, um, you probably want to err more towards the rich side. Likewise, if you just want to get something out there and see if it has legs before you spend you know, several tens of millions of dollars on it, then you'd probably go the other way. You can get good and healthy combinations of both, but obviously you can't have them both perfect at the same time unless you're willing to spend lots of that. Okay. You can do it. If you have the resources, for instance, I mean, you, the, um, the Microsoft, like the Office Suite apps on iOS are beautiful. But not everybody has the, the resources of Microsoft to actually build them natively each time. So um, obviously, the, the Microsoft apps on, on the Windows phone, well, they're great. They're you know, effectively baked in, and they're wonderful. But again, you, you're not always going to be able to do that. If you're just writing the, you know, my first social media sharing app, uh, and you have to write it for three or four or five different platforms, you know, it's going to be expensive. So the next consideration that, that we have is what kind of approach are we going to take? And it's very much um, it's evolutionary versus planned. Now, planned kind of gives the, the connotations of big design up front. Um, and yes, there are elements of that, so be really, really careful. But you also need to have an understanding more from a strategic perspective of where are you going to invest? Are you going to invest? Is mobile a core component of your business? Is it now? Will it be? Is it a core component of one of your competitors' businesses, and are they going to steal the march on you? Okay. So when we're looking at these kinds of decision points, what we really care about is how much do we actually know about the, the mobile landscape and our place in it over the next couple of years? Answer, if, anybody's saying, if anybody other than Microsoft, Apple, and Google are saying we know lots, probably rethink that. The mobile landscape is changing very, very fast. Uh, most of this content, for what it's worth, um, I would expect to be obsolete within two years, three at the outside. Um, that's it. We're still, we're still spending, as an industry, huge amounts on mobile development. Um, yeah, mobile ad revenue is, you know, if it hasn't already eclipsed desktop, certainly the growth has. Uh, as far as you know, um, revenue from mobile advertisements versus m revenue from desktop advertisements, desktop's pretty much flat, plateaued. Mobile's still growing at insane rates. Um, mobile first is a thing. Um, you know, most social media consumption for quite some time now has been on mobile devices. We, we, we know this. Um, we, we have the stats. Uh, but where are we going to be in two years? 
nobody really knows. Nobody's really all that confident, and that's largely because the industry heavyweights are all still really fighting it out. There's a huge battle for market share going on. Um, people are taking this one very, very seriously, which is wonderful because it means the pace of innovation is great, but also that this content will be obsolete very soon. <laughs> so when we're making our decision, and again, this is a decision that you have to make based on your own context, um, are we just going to dip our toes in the water and see? Do we just need an app because, well, if you don't have an app, who are you? Or are we actually just going to jump in, boots and all, and say, OK, mobile is now a core component of our business? Now, the evolutionary approach is, well, let's just dip our toes in and see how we go. And that means that we can afford to make a very small investment. But if we make a very small investment, we're not going to get the beautiful apps. So it could be a bit of a catch-22 situation in that we could have actually made a huge splash if we'd spent you know, $500,000 on building an app, but we weren't sure that we should, so we only spent $50,000 on building an app, and now we've actually learned the wrong lesson because we you know, tried to, to find the wrong data. Um, one of the other things you need to take into account when you're looking at just purely budget is what's already feasible within my organization. So what skill sets do my teams already have? Um, if I've already got, for instance, a whole bunch of really, really good JavaScript developers, for instance, so that you know, like they're in you know, Angular or React or Flux or you know, buzzword of choice, I don't really mind. Um, but if they're really, really great, then perhaps we can build a hybrid application for very little money and without going outside to hire any more expertise. We can maintain it in-house, we can bug fix it in-house, we can ship it really fast, and it's a very, very cheap experiment. Wonderful. Um, will that solve your problem? Don't know, but that's a question you have to ask yourselves. If we just do that, are we actually going to get enough data to make any meaningful decisions? If you look at, for instance, when um, Twitter built, what was it, Periscope? Hmm? All right. They're not going to get away with building a, you know, a crappy little first cut implementation of that and then releasing it. Like, what, and what was the first the app that prompted that? Meerkat. The demoed it. I can't remember which, um, uh, which event that, that started that, but it was one of the, the major um, festivals in the States. Um, might have been Burning Man. But anyway, so if that hadn't been beautiful from, from the get-go, no one would have used it. So it never would have hit that popularity threshold. It never would have justified expense, further expenditure on itself. It just wouldn't have made sense. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, the last thing, of course, to think about is, well, where are we going to be again at least 12 months from now? Try to look that far ahead, see how you go. Um, if the answer to that is, I don't know, then really your decision point comes down to what can you afford to risk? What can you afford to risk budget-wise? What can you afford to risk reputation-wise? Can you afford to build a really, really shiny app and have nobody use it? Versus can you afford to build a pretty decent app for a whole lot less money but tarnish your reputation? You don't have to tarnish your reputation, but you need to be careful. That needs to factor into your decision-making process. So the nice thing about the evolutionary approach, though, is that you get data really, really early. You can put half-finished things in front of you know, some friendly customers or some internal people or you know, whoever your most likely people are who are going to provide you with constructive feedback. That feedback may well be, that's awful. We need to spend 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. Or that feedback may be, oh, yeah, it's all right if it did these things. Now, once we're in feature territory, that means we've probably, with a caveat there, but we've probably given a good enough user experience that we don't have to worry too much more. If your complaints are coming in about lack of features, that's actually a good thing for your minimum viable product. If your complaints are coming in about it's slow, it's buggy, it's clunky, I don't like using it, you have a problem. Okay, and you need to start rethinking your strategy. The nice thing is that we can make decisions on those data. We can make real decisions on real data. We can put it in front of real people. We can get their subjective feedback from hopefully constructive tweets to us, or from App Store reviews or anything like that. Um, but we can also get quantitative feedback from just within application metrics. Okay. So people always navigate to this thing and then hit the back button. OK, maybe we need to relabel that. Maybe it's confusing. What did they actually end up at? So they go this thing back, that thing back, that thing, and then they stay. OK, 
our navigation's a problem, or this was the thing that they were trying to achieve, perhaps we should bring that front and center of the app. Okay? But we can make those decisions on real data, which is incredibly powerful. Um, and obviously, we can do this for a whole lot less because we're not building an entire feature set before we actually ship it. Okay. What is a minimum viable product? I didn't bring lollies, so I can't offer one, but there should be a prize for the person who can guess what image is going to be on the next slide. Right. Is everyone familiar with this image? Do we need to go through this? We probably should. Yeah. So minimum viable product, what do, we need? what do we mean by that? Well, firstly, it's not junk. It's not garbage. It's not poor quality. Okay. We ship something that is minimally viable, which means it is viable. That means it doesn't damage our brand. It doesn't damage our reputation. It doesn't make people think, oh, yeah, but no, it's still pretty awful and I won't use it. And then later on, when we come back and say, hey, but we built all of this cool stuff for you now, they say, oh, yeah, but you know, I tried and it was a bit meh, nah, so I'm not going to bother having them. That, that's not viable. What we care about when we, mean, when we say viability is we can ship this, people will get value from it, and they will continue to use the app. Then we can start adding features or tweaking things or do whatever else we, you know, we do, and we're going to continue to broaden our audience rather than have this, oh, no, nobody's interested anymore. And then, guys, we, we made it nice for you. And six months later, nobody cares. Okay. So the way to do that is you give them something that works. You give people something that works first. Um, in our first example, obviously, until we actually have a car, nobody's happy because nothing works. Right? If we look at what we've actually got there, um, We've got a wheel. Hooray, we've got two wheels. Hooray, we've got like a chassis and some stuff. And it doesn't work. I can't get in it and go somewhere. Whereas if we look at the, you know, the skateboard metaphor sorry, that we have up here, well, one, yeah, it's a skateboard. Who's fallen off a skateboard? Anybody? Way back when we were like young and irresponsible and yes. <laughs> yeah. Longer ago than some of us would like to think now. Um, but, but the thing is, with a skateboard, you could get from A to B. Now, it wasn't all that glamorous. Right? And people would you know, look at you a little bit funny and think that you're a bit of a you know, punk kid, whatever. But it was a whole lot faster than walking. So I can buy a cheap, you know, and you, know, you would get, you know, in your, like your Santa sack, whatever, you get a cheap skateboard from Kmart. Okay, and it costs 20 bucks or whatever it costs. But you're cooler than the kids who didn't have one, and it helps you get to school faster. Okay. You're not going to turn up to a board meeting on a skateboard, unless you're like, you know, Zach Holman or someone. Um, but it works. It helps. It provides a feature. It provides a capability that you didn't that you didn't previously have. Likewise, then we add you know, a little bit of handlebars. Now we've got a scooter, and now it's a little bit more versatile because we can give it to smaller children who have slightly less, you know, less, I guess, developed balance or. We can you know, fold the thing and collapse the thing and do a few other tricks on it. You know, it has a few more features. Yeah. We move on. Now we have a bicycle. Um, are there any cyclists in the room? Wow. I suddenly feel very lonely. <laughs> okay. As the cyclist in the room, I would kind of put this the other way. I'd actually put them in the car and then the motorcycle and then the, the road bike. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But so, yeah, with a bicycle, you can get a whole lot of places a whole lot faster. Um, you can do a whole lot more things. It gives you a broader range. Again, you've increased your feature set. You're still not going to turn up to a board meeting in it. Um, then you have a motorcycle. And you're not going to turn up and give a presentation to a bunch of people in the morning with a bunch of like, CTOs and you know, high-end dev managers and people in the room on a motorcycle, are you? Who would do that? Rob Halford from Jim's Priest. <laughs> What kind of idiot would do that? Likewise, if you were, for instance, the finance minister of, of any new country, would you turn up to any new finance committee meeting on a motorcycle? Actually, yeah, you would. And a leather jacket. There's a pretty cool leather jacket, too. <laughs> well, maybe they couldn't afford the car just yet. And then finally, we're going to go the full-featured car. And then even within the car, OK, fine, you're going to buy yourself a little hatchback when you're a kid, and then you're going to buy yourself the 7 Series when you can afford it, or whatever your, your mark of choice is. Tesla. But, uh, yeah, or you, well, you should buy a Tesla. Um, once you can actually, again, what? 
Speaking of Tesla, though, that's actually a really good example of minimum viable product because the Tesla Model S, for instance, beautiful. Um, they've gone beyond insane mode, by the way. They now have a ludicrous mode. <laughs> Bonus marks for the Spaceballs reference? Yeah. Um, so they do. They actually have a ludicrous mode, and it's a software change that costs you $10,000. But right now, in Australia, the Tesla Model S is actually not even here as far as proper transport capability is concerned. Oh, okay, maybe it's here because I can't skate between Brisbane and Melbourne or Brisbane and Sydney or whatever. But it's actually quite difficult to drive a Tesla between Brisbane and Sydney or Sydney and Melbourne. They're putting a network of superchargers on the east coast of Australia and that's wonderful, but you still can't just jump in it and drive your car. So that's actually an example of where in Australia, because we don't have the infrastructure, we've kind of taken a bit more of this kind of approach. Right? It's a beautiful car. It doesn't really car all that well just, just yet. It will when the infrastructure's there, but right now it doesn't. So we've covered some of the, uh, the characteristics of minimum viable product. I won't really worry too much about these. One of the things we care about, though, is that we really need to provoke some kind of emotive response to it, and it needs to be a positive one. We want people to like our product. Even if it's a line of business app, for doing expense reporting. We want people to like it because if they hate doing it, well, one, we've made the world a slightly worse place than it was. If they'd rather do manual TPS reports, wow, what have we wrought? Okay, make people like it. It's actually not that hard. Um, put yourself in the position of the person who's going to be using it. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. When you have people in that kind of positive mindset, they'll also give you very constructive feedback. You then must act on that feedback which comes back to your decision earlier about, well, can we afford to iterate? How much can we afford to spend? But you must act on it and demonstrate that you're acting on it so that people continue to give you good feedback. If people give you really good, meaningful, thoughtful feedback and you go, yeah, thanks, whatever, well, that's not going to last very long. Okay? So you need to be able to iterate on it, but you need to make people want to help you. And that's easier than it sounds. You just have to pay attention to it. Obligatory LinkedIn found a quote there. Right. If you're not at least a little bit embarrassed by it, you probably shipped it too late. That doesn't mean, oh, I really wish we hadn't shipped that. Right? That means, yeah, it's pretty good. We're pretty proud of it. But there's probably a but. Okay? It's also a very different consideration. Even there, for instance, if you're a startup, yes, absolutely, you should be embarrassed by your first product. If you are an Apple or a Microsoft and this is going to be your flagship offering on your new platform, Absolutely, you should not be embarrassed by it. You should be able to say, ta-da, here it is, look at this. Okay. So, so we're going to start simple. All right. We're going to start simple with cross-platform. Uh, we're going to use the current skill sets for the, for the most part. So if we're actually going to just start a little bit, uh, use what we've got, use what we know. It might not be our long-term strategy. We might throw it out. That's okay. You need to make the decision about whether it is okay, but that is a perfectly valid decision. To, you can't just say, well, well, well we, we, we built it, therefore it has value. No, we built it. It created value for us in some way. That value may have just been, we learned a whole lot. And now we put it to a side and we build what we actually meant to build, but we build it with all of our learnings incorporated. That's great. Give it to people, measure. Measure, measure, measure. You've all heard you know, the parable of the, you know, the, the angry product manager who storms in and says, you know, get rid of the duck, or you know, make it all pink, or make it all green, or whatever. Um, <coughs> you're going to have some kind of you know, uh, you know, user experience, people user experience expertise. Um, if nothing else, we're all human. We can all at least say, well, I don't like that, but I don't know why. And maybe we can start asking people well, why that is, and we can go and figure it out. Um, but it's a whole lot more important to measure. Get the data, figure out what people are doing with it, because then when you have a hypothesis about, well, I don't like it, and I think that's because this reason, mm -hmm. other people who exhibit that same behavior, I wonder if that's their reason as well. So their path through the app, is it the same as mine? Um, can I find something? Basically, can I disprove my hypothesis here? Okay. So you're still going to have to use your intuition to figure out what you think might be happening, but you can then go and look at the hard data to say, well, actually, that sounds quite reasonable. Or 
no, I'm completely off base here. I've got no idea what's happening. Maybe I need to go and get some other opinions. OK, you seem to be aware of that. And again, evolve. Right? You must, must, must iterate. You must demonstrate that you care. This guy means money. Right? If you're building a big suite of mobile apps up front, even if you're just building one big mobile app, but it has to be the all singing, all dancing, beautiful app, um, you're going to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You're also going to go into areas of skill set where you possibly aren't comfortable anymore. Um, so for instance, who's, who, who has the people who know Objective-C on their team? One, one, two. Does anybody have people who like Objective-C on their team? <laughs> okay. It's not the li nicest of languages, and Apple knows this, which is why they created Swift, which actually is quite a nice language. Who knows Swift? Who has people who know Swift? Who thinks they could hire people who know Swift? No, you can. <laughs> uh, the, the reality is you could, but it's hard. Right? You're going to have to hire people. You're going to have to identify, well, firstly, you're going to have to identify people who have those skills. You're going to have to identify how to identify people who have those skills. If I'm hiring into an area where I already have a lot of expertise, I can pretty quickly spot a fake. I'll ask them a few questions, and they go, what? And I go, thanks for coming. Right? But if I'm hiring into an area that's completely foreign to me, then I'm not going to know what questions to ask. And someone doesn't have to be deliberately misleading. They may genuinely think that they're wonderful. And they could be a really nice person. And I'm recruiting someone, let's say I'm recruiting a software development manager to build this entirely new team. And I say, you need to be able to do this, this, and this. You need to be able to assess people on that, that, that. And they say, yeah, sure, I can do that. No worries. And they believe it. Um, well. Great, no one set out to do a bad thing here, but all of a sudden we have an inappropriate hire who's then going to go and hire other inappropriate people. And now we've created a bit of a problem for ourselves because they're going to release something that's, well, your best case scenario is you'll find out after you've sunk cash but not reputation. Your worst case scenario is you're going to commit publicly to a release date because remember we're doing this up front, which means we're going to coordinate it with things like a big bang marketing campaign. So we're going to set ourselves up for not really having much room for error. And that means that the team is going to be given a deadline and a feature set and be told, make it happen. And the team will, because again, they mean well, they're well-intentioned people, and that's great, but the product's going to be a massive letdown, and you're going to suffer reputational damage for a huge amount of cash. Okay. Now, not every, app, sorry, not every uh, mobile initiative goes like that. If you have the expertise already or if you can find someone who does and then you can build a team to, to actually do that, you, you're laughing. Great. Good for you. Um, likewise, if people have got a really good track record, if this, isn't, if this isn't your first Rodeo and you know this person because they've already built a bunch of apps and they have a really good portfolio and you can trust them to put a really good team or set of teams together, that's wonderful too. Who in this room right now, though, thinks that they could hire people? Let's say, for instance, Microsoft just you know, released not so long ago um, all of the Office Suite for, for iOS. Who in this room thinks that they could hire a program manager to put together a team of people, or a team of teams of people, to do that? Who actually thinks, not that I know where to find those people, but I know how to identify them? Because I'm getting one confident hand, and everyone else is like, oh, actually, that's quite hard when you think about it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the flip side, of course, is you can have a beautiful result. And that gets you market share, and then that's you know, snowballing success. Wonderful. So we need to think back to our decision points. When we're going, OK, what's my mobile strategy going to be? Um, what are the key things that we care about? First and foremost, what problem am I solving? What problem am I solving, and for whom? What is my target audience? What are they going to care about? Because that's part of the problem that I need to solve. Okay? If that's not your first and foremost consideration, it really, really should be. You need to take a step back and actually ask yourself, well, okay, why are we actually doing this? What, what, why are we solving a problem that we haven't even identified? If your problem, there, there, there is a corollary to, corollary to this, which is if your problem is we need an app because we need an app because everyone has an app and you're nobody if you don't have an app, well, maybe that's actually a valid problem to solve. Um, maybe you know, we need an app just because we then have something installed on lots of pe people's devices, and we can send them push notifications. And we don't really know what it's going to do yet. So let's think of a thing that would be kind of useful. 
just to actually get presence on people's devices. That may be a valid business goal, but you need to understand that that's the problem you're solving. If, just, if your CTO or CIO or CEO just you know, storms in and says, we need an app, build me an app, well, perhaps that's the problem that you're solving. You know, make the CEO stop shouting. But <laughs> Come on, who's solved that problem before? Who's wanted to solve that problem before? OK, that may be a valid problem, but it's still probably worth asking the question, well, why do you want an app? Because why are you shouting? Because there must be another problem here. Business goals. I cannot stress that enough. Next consideration, again, your richness versus how far you want to reach your target market. Um, you want, one of the things that we haven't really covered, we'll, we'll look at in a minute, is um, performance. Actually, actually, no, we'll postpone performance. That's right. We'll come back to it. So the richness of the UI we really, really do care about. Device integration, again, you'd have to think about, well, am I going to use device features? Is it just going to be a photo sharing app? OK, great. I can do that in whatever platform and technology and language I want. Or is it a particular device capability that's a new shiny, like NFC payments or whatever, although that's not all that new. But once upon a time, it was new, and people, you know, the first movers on it did well. Um, likewise, who are we targeting? Are we targeting a closed group of employees, and I can give them a choice between a Surface Pro 3 or an iPad? Or are we saying it's going to be an SOE, and you will all get Blackberries? Or, yeah, I saw at least one cringe there, although they're doing OK now. Um, better. Right. Or are we basically just going to say, look, um, run what you've run? And we'll sort it out. We'll support that. Okay, so you have to think about those things. And again, all of those are valid positions for your organization to take, depending on your own circumstances. But you need to include those in your decision-making process. Likewise, you care about your team skill set. What can we do with people in-house versus what do we have to go and hire people for? The last one that we haven't really touched on is performance. Performance is what you, you get a lot of people saying, the app must perform really well. But they don't actually understand what that means. Does that mean the UI is really snappy? Does that mean that it just doesn't crash? Does it mean that it feels native, for whatever definition of, of native? Does it mean, for instance, that we're actually going to do a huge amount of number crunching on the device, and so we need to be writing in something like C++ where we can, or you know, Objective-C, well, you know, we, we need to be writing native Java, or can we do the whole thing in JavaScript? Okay. Um, you need to understand what performance goals you have, right? but then you will be precluded from using some tool sets based on what those performance goals might be. So your technology options. Now, we're not going to go too deep into the technology side of things here. This is more, uh, here is what you should Google, or here is what you should ask your people to, to Google. Um, in, I guess, particular sort of particular approaches more so than particular technology. So we're going to talk like you know, hybrid versus web versus a few other things, but I don't really care about getting into you know, Xamarin or you know, Xamarin's on the list, but you know, whether it's Xamarin, Xamarin Forms, whether it's you know, your new favorite you know, Go cross-compiler thingy, we don't care. So the first one, your first possible candidate, we're just going to build a website. Why not? Well, actually, that's a pretty good first point, right? Who doesn't have a website? Who's, who doesn't have a responsive website? Who doesn't know if you've got a responsive website? Really? <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, that's a fair answer. Now, obviously, again, your responsive website can reach pretty much everyone who's got a web browser. That's a lot of people. Right? It's not all that rich. Um, website, things like you can't use the camera, you can't use device features. It's hard to use accelerometers. You can kind of do it sometimes depending on the browser. But again, you're then talking graceful degradation of what if this feature is not available to me. Most browsers, for instance, support geolocation now. Some of them will give you access to the camera API. Some won't, um, and so on. So you're talking, well, we're really got a very, very minimal feature set here. Maybe that's OK. Maybe that's OK if that's what we're shooting for. Okay. Um, HTML5 is actually doing pretty well. So I would expect this slide would be one of the one of the candidates to change the most over the next couple of years. It may well be that HTML5 capabilities do actually start to eclipse native apps in some ways. I wouldn't bet on it just yet, but expect this slide to be obsolete after, like, today. Okay. Um, a lot of the cons of just building a responsive website, um, content's actually hard. Right? If you haven't designed for responsiveness, right from the get-go, then you're actually looking at a redesign of possibly your entire online presence. You know, hey, you know, we, we need an app, but really all we really want to do is build a you know, 
responsive website. We should just make our corporate website responsive. OK. What we've just signed up for there is a complete redesign of our flagship website. Okay. That's not trivial. It could be easy, but wouldn't bet on it. Um, functionality gets hidden. Yeah, we all know that. Like the little you know, dot, 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 you know, ellipsis up in the top right, or the top left, or the bottom left, or the bottom right, or somewhere else. But sometimes it's in a, what's, is there a term for the vertical ellipsis? You know, three dots, dot, dot, dot. Right. So you have to hide functionality. You have to have people look in you know, cascading menus and things, because well, where else do you hide all the features? Um, and obviously, it's going to be slow. Okay. Of all of your options, it's probably going to be the slowest one. Right. Apps, though, well, with a native app, you can use all of the device features. Isn't that nice? Um, it feels like an extension of your operating system, if you've done it right. Okay. Your native Windows Phone apps feel like they belong there. Mm -hmm. Things like the back button, right? using the back button as an, an integral part of a user experience is actually incredibly powerful. And when people hit the back button and it doesn't behave the way they expect, well, that's jarring. So that's marks off the user experience. Um, it's really easy to make them work offline. You don't have to have access to a web server, web browser. Hey, that means that we can have people not be connected to the internet and still use the app. It's actually quite useful for things like um, Satellite navigation. Who uses Google Maps for navigation? Yeah. What happens when you go through a tunnel? <laughs> I get no map tiles and it doesn't know where I am anymore. And then I come out of the tunnel and I've got like four different choices of you know which direction I go. And the phone's like, yeah, uh, give me a minute while I get the GPS back. And um, and I've like I've driven three times over the Sydney Harbour Bridge, for instance, <laughs> trying to spot a turn that was immediately to the left when. Yeah, the, the sat nav just couldn't keep up. Whereas your offline sat nav, so something like TomTom Tom or uh, the um, Nokia Maps one, um, they'll have a lot of offline capability that makes it a whole lot easier. You go even further offline and integrate it into your car, and then you can do things like, well, how far have we gone based on how many times the wheels have turned? Hey, we're probably at the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel now, you should turn left. Okay, so you get a huge amount of, I guess, additional capability, but it costs a whole lot more to build a sat nav into a car than it does to just stick a web app on a phone. So we're paying for that. Um, one of the cool things that you get out of a native app is your app store discovery. All right? People find apps through the app store. And that means they get recommended features and you know, hey, today's editorial picks and all that sort of stuff. If your app doesn't exist, if you don't have one, well, you're not going to get that. So. Um, we won't spend too much time on this. We've covered most of these points. The one thing that I would call out as far as the cons of apps are concerned is a long tail of updates. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are app store commissions. If you're making lots of money and lots of sales on your app, well, that's great. I, you know, I, you know, so I'm, I'm selling tens of thousands. What was Flappy Bird the, the app? Like, you know, selling 40,000 US dollars worth of app per day. You know, how much do you care that Apple's going to take a small cut of that? Like, really? Um, you might, but probably not. The, the big problems, though, that you need to be aware of, uh, because it's an app, people can choose not to update it. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft, in, uh, in Windows 10, you get your Windows updates. End of discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. There's a critical security patch, and the whole world has it. Oh, that's nice. But your mobile apps aren't like that. You, know, you can turn on auto-update, but a lot of people will leave it switched off. And a lot of people will actually are actually suspicious of updates because you know, they might take this feature away from me, or you know, I like it just the way it is, or whatever. So that means that not only do you have old apps out in the field, but you then have to have those apps continue to work, which means things like your API surface in-house needs, you know, needs to remain consistent. So if it's just a crappy old app and you ship it and it doesn't talk to anything, that's fine. But what app on a mobile device doesn't talk to something? So then whatever it talks to needs to exist for as long as that app's going to exist. If you have an old, deprecated version of the API, but you still have 30% of your customer base on the old app because they like it, then you have to support your old API as well as your new one and your new one and your new one for all of your other versions, okay? which introduces a whole lot of additional maintenance overhead. So contrast that with a web app where you can just say, well, it's a web app. Everyone's got the new version, which means the APIs have been updated and they get maintained and the job is done. So there are trade-offs there. Um, we've touched on authentication, we've touched on back end, we've touched on UI design, but I will just call out, you're going to need to design 
either once for everything or once for every platform. There's kind of no real way around that. You can do a little bit of, oh, maybe this is my flagship platform, so you know, I'll do a, you know, a, a, a super special whiz-bang experience for that. And the other ones can just be meh. And so the other ones can just use you know, generic looking controls and navigation and all that sort of stuff. But this one, this is where I'm going to spend all of my effort. But even then, if you've started down that path, you can spend a lot of effort on your flagship platform, but you're probably still using a lot of the underlying technology that's kind of spread across, across all of them. So you're never going to get the beautiful native experience by doing it that way. You can get close, but not quite. Native apps, obviously, beautifully rich, not all that much reach. Not all that much reach. If you are OK with the level of exposure you can get from a single app store, go for your life. Just include that in your decision making process. Skip, skip, skip. Hybrid web apps are actually pretty cool. Um, largely because, again, we can, we can use a lot of our existing skill sets. And there are a lot of shims now. There are a lot of shims that actually give us access to the device's native capabilities in a way that's actually pretty easy to program against. And where those shims don't exist, by and large, you can write them. So you might have to write a shim for, let's say you've got a you know, iris scanning feature on a particular phone or whatever it is. Um, and uh, you know, that's not supported in JavaScript. You can write yourself a Cordova plugin that does that, and you write that in native code for that platform. Now, you have to write that plugin n times over for as many platforms as you have. But then you can code on top of that and just you know, write once, run anywhere. Yeah. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of ways. This is effectively becoming the front runner for line of business apps and for a lot of social apps. Okay, so you're writing it in HTML and JavaScript. And again, you can use React, you can use Flux, you can use Angular, V1 or V2. You can use all of the shiny JavaScript buzzwords. And that's really cool. You can use Gulp and Grunt and these and that. Um, there's a huge amount of innovation in this space, largely because people want it to be as nice to, to actually create an app as, as native. They want to be able to create native feeling apps using HTML5 and JavaScript. The tooling is there um, as far as the actual development experience is concerned. Um, we're not quite there yet as, as far as the experience is concerned. But who's seen, for instance, um, Ionic, the Ionic framework? Right. Pretty slick. Right. Pretty good. Now, how good is that going to be? And to take into account, uh, sorry, into account things like um, hardware acceleration for CSS. Right. Now, Ionic Framework in a year's time may be amazing. It may be perfectly native feeling, or it could be totally crashed and burned and gone out of business. Uh, there could be something new. But the trajectory is pretty good for those kinds of things. A couple of the cons you need to be aware of, though. Um, Apple, in particular, looks fairly unfavorably on apps that are just effectively a UI web view with a web, web page shoved inside them. You need to still make it feel like an app. One of the strategies that we've had a lot of success with is write your app and then serve it from a web browser as well. But you actually write it as if it's going to be an app that you're going to bundle up in your, you know, your app builder container or your, whatever your Cordova container of, of choice is. Um, and then we just happen to publish that app on a website. That tends to work quite well. Um, but yeah, you do have to just keep an eye on are you going to get approval through you know, various app stores? And by and large, that's becoming a less of an issue, but it's still not zero risk. So if you take this kind of approach, ship it early. Try to do a soft launch. Try to actually get it into the store, and then do an update, because updates are a lot less pain than actually getting an app approved initially. Um, you do have to care about rendering differences in some of the browsers. Um, Obviously, across all of iOS, you still get the Safari you know, WebKit rendering engine. Um, on Android, yes, you get WebKit again, but it is slightly different. Google's forked it. Whoops. Okay. Um, likewise, on um, on uh, Edge, what's the it's Edge now? Yeah, Edge, IE 11 rendering engine. Um, that's really, really fast. It's really, really cool, but it's slightly different. Okay. Um, ironically, Safari, so like, Apple's WebKit is actually looking at being the poster child of how not to do web. Safari is actually the browser that's being left behind at the moment, which is a little bit embarrassing for, for Apple. But people are actually, you know, with, with the retirement of the old uh, was it Trident and then the other rendering engine from, um, from Internet Explorer and going to, to Edge to, to the new one, um, yeah, Safari is actually the, the problem child now. So there's always going to be one, though. 
there's always going to be one. There is never going to be a scenario where there is only one browser or all browsers are equal, because that's kind of not how the, the browser market works. So just bear that in mind. So HTML5 and JavaScript, pretty, pretty cool. Um, your next option, though, is a cross-compiled app, um, which basically means you write it in the language of your choice, and we will cross-compile it and build a particular binary for each platform in hopefully native binary code of some form. Um, and that's really, really cool when it works. And it works a whole lot better now than it did a couple of years ago. When it stops working, though, as in when you ask just that little bit too much of your cross-compiler, then you're in a bit of trouble. Because all of a sudden, you're looking at, well, either we just can't do that, or we have to look at a very different way of doing that, or we actually now have to go and write the whole app in a native language all over again. You may be willing to run that risk. That may be a valid decision. But be aware that you do run the risk of getting to the point with a cross-compiled app where you just go, this just won't work. Um, you'll learn lots about things called trampolines and other things when you do cross-compilation. It's all good fun. Um, you've got a couple of ways of doing this one. One is you share the whole shebang. So you share the like, back-end services, the logic, the UI, everything. Um, and you try to just pretend that there is one true abstract device that doesn't actually exist. Um, and then you compile for that. That's a really, really hard problem to solve. And the technology in that space is not yet particularly mature. Okay, contrast that with something like Cordova. Like Visual Studio has some um, Cordova build support in it now. Did you know that? How cool is that? Okay. Um, likewise, you can get Xamarin plugins for Visual Studio and all the rest of it. Um, last I heard, you still needed a MacBook to slave it to, to, to build for iOS. But you can, you can do it. But what you really want is write the code once, run it on all the platforms. That means you have to have an ideal platform. You, know, you have to have some sort of platform archetype, which we don't really have. Um, the other way you can do it, and we've had a bit more success with this approach, is you write all of your, obviously, your back-end services can be the same. Um, your logic can be the same. And then you just write a different UI layer for each platform that you're supporting. Now, that means you're still writing a bunch of separate apps. You're maintaining a bunch of separate apps. You want to add a feature, you add it once to your back end and three times to your front end. But it's cheaper than you know, building three different implementations of the same feature. Um, it's, it's a good trade. Um, we've had some really, really good success with that. Generally, the, the UI experience is where the cross-compilation falls down because it just tries to do too much. It's a really, really hard problem to solve. The efforts are good, but they're not great. Um, skip that. One of the nice things, of course, again, is if you like C-sharp, you can write your apps in C-sharp, and that's great. You don't have to learn JavaScript, although you probably should. You don't have to learn you know, Go or Rust or Swift or Objective-C or Java or whatever. You can use what you've got. Um, we say full device capabilities. It's full device capabilities for the lowest common denominator of device. Mm -hmm. For the lowest common denominator of device, you know, if, there is, if there is no NFC chip, your payment app can compile and deploy beautifully, but it's not going to work. Right? If I'm going to hold you know, a, an old phone against a, a paywave terminal, that's not going to do anything. It doesn't matter how great the app is, the hardware doesn't support it. Okay. Um, the platform lock-in, the only one I'd call out of, of these points is the platform lock-in. You really are committing to spend a lot of effort on the platform. You're going to get people asking for features that only that platform has because the users, your users of that platform are used to having those features. Right? My phone has NFC. Why doesn't your app do NFC? This is really logical to me. Whereas someone who's never had NFC is not even going to know to ask for that feature. So then you're in the position of having to say to one group of customers, hey, like, um, we respect your device choice and all, but um, you just never get that feature. Or you say to the other group of customers, well, because those people over there made a device choice that suited them but doesn't suit you, you can't have the feature that you want. And that's not going to go down well either. So what you end up doing is you end up tacking on a feature for NFC for the devices that have it and you know, gyroscopic camera stabilization or whatever for the devices that can do that in real time. And you end up again in the, the gradual and graceful degradation sort of story where if the device doesn't have this capability, then you just don't advertise it. But at the same time, you're then maintaining all of those different code branches. You're maintaining all of those different, um, you know, different feature sets in different ways for different platforms. Then the laggard platform does actually create 
that particular thing, does introduce that device support, and it's totally different. So now we have one implementation over here, which is probably fairly well tested by now, and it's working and it's stable, and another one over here, it's completely different, and now, worse than that, we've dictated the user experience of our app based on what this particular subset of devices could do. And now we have to rethink not only just the device capabilities, but also the user experience in order to bring new people into the fold. Okay? So watch out for that. And again, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying watch out for it. It will cost you. It may be a valid cost. Okay. So um, these slides will be up on, I think, SlideShare before too long, so don't worry too much about this one. But basically, here is your grid of you know, decision-making aids. Um, really what it comes down to is if you have oodles and oodles and oodles of money, build all the native apps. Go for your life. It really doesn't matter. If you can afford to just burn that much cash or you have a particular brand obligation to do that, do it. It costs what it costs, but it will be worth it to you. If you don't have oodles and oodles and oodles of money or you're not a Microsoft or an Apple or a Google, then really you should be looking at, well, okay, what problem am I solving? What are the constraints that I'm having to solve that in? What's the minimum I can get away with? Is the minimum that I can get away with really minimum? Or is it, you know what, it's so close to just build the whole shebang anyway that we may as well just commit to it. Or we may as well just sink the cash into it and go. A couple of case studies. Um, don't know if anybody's familiar with this one. Um, so Blue Sky Fund, so Blue Sky Alternative Investments, I think it's Proprietary Limited, uh, which is the parent company. Um, it's also Redify's parent company. Um, this is one of the projects that we ran well, quite a while ago now, and it's a responsive website that we've also turned into an app. So this is just a responsive website. This is actually a screenshot from desktop in a browser. Um, that's a big browser, and then that's a little browser, same page. So you can see we've got the menu across the top, and here it's collapsed into a drop-down. Um, bonus points for who can give me the CSS and JavaScript framework that we used for that. Bootstrap. Bootstrap. Right. Bootstrap. It's really, really easy, really, really quick to get up and running, and it's pretty nice. Um, it works really well. It does a really great job. Um, we've also wrapped that up and shoved it into an app container and then dropped it onto iOS and Android, and um, I think there's a Windows Phone one in the, the pipeline as well. But by and large, people's experience of that is a website. It's the same. Okay. Um, a hybrid web app. Um, we like this one. I'm quite proud of this one. But basically what you can do, this is in the app store at the moment. Um, uh, didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> but we really are. This, we're actually proud of this app for a, a number of reasons. Um, basically, one of the considerations you have to look at it you know, as cost is what are we actually achieving? In this case, what are we achieving? How much worth do you place on saving one baby's life? Now, again, this comes back to our business goals, if you would call that a business goal. But that's a pretty valuable thing to achieve, I would kind of think. Um, people who work on this absolutely love doing it because it's an important thing to do. That aside, it's a hybrid web app. Works really quite nicely. It's HTML and JavaScript. I think this one's Angular. Doesn't really matter. Right? But it's wrapped up into an app container using Cordova and it gets published to the app stores. Um, it was a relatively cheap app to build, but you still get a nice high quality experience out of it. There's kind of no value in making this one a, a native app. We would reduce our reach. Okay. Reach in this case is really important. Now, we're still selling it through, well, yeah, promoting it, it's free. But it gets promoted through the app stores. But the most important thing in this particular circumstance is we want as many people who we can actually get into each of the studies to be involved. So if we were to say to people, OK, so you, know, you, have, to be, you have to meet these medical criteria. Oh, and by the way, you have to have an iPhone 6 Plus. Well, why? Right? So we care a lot about reach in this kind of circumstance. If you have a phone, this will work. Okay? And that's great. This one. So this one's a Xamarin and a Xamarin Forms app. Um, the reason that the, uh, the choice was made to go Xamarin for this particular app is, uh, and this, this one's, uh, we built it in Australia, and they've sub subsequently decided it's going global. Um, they, they really, really like it. Um, there are a couple of UI components in this application that were incredibly difficult to do in JavaScript, either with SVG or Canvas or whatever. They're basically like an animated spinning wheel and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it's really nice and interactive, and you could do it using a hybrid web app model, but it's going to be slow and clunky. 
And in this particular case, one of the priorities was it needs to be nice. People need to want to use it. It's our people. If the very first thing to you say, that you say to is, is it like how to engage our people, how to keep our people coming back and engaged with what we're doing, and, you know, um, and then you say to them, yeah, well, that's kind of important, but we don't actually value you enough to give you a nice user experience, that's the wrong impression to give people. Yeah, we totally value and we built you an app, and it's pretty awful, and yeah, but, but we do value you. Okay. So in this case, richness was so much more important because they wanted to give their people a nice experience. They wanted to keep them coming back. That was really, really important. And we couldn't give them a clunky experience first up and then say, ah, oh, but this will get better. Okay. We had to make it really nice right from the beginning um, and then go from there. So that's your sort of your, your other end of the, the scale as far as richness. Now, the, the last um, case I'll show you is not a Redify application. I'll say that just so it doesn't look like we're appropriating other people's work. But this is amazing. Um, this is Instagram's hyperlapse. Um, has anybody used it? Anyone seen it? Okay. It does uh, a combination of uh, time lapse. So you've seen um, the Microsoft hyperlapse. Video like demos out of Microsoft Research, all right? The whole not just time lapse, but actually smoothing the video and cropping out the irrelevant bits and all those sorts of things. So it's absolutely amazing. Um, so Instagram has an, an app that does pretty much that. It uses the well, one it uses obviously the camera to capture imagery. It uses the camera also for image stabilization. It also uses the phone's gyroscope for image stabilization. It's actually doing IS in real time as the image actually comes in, not stitching the, um, you know, you, you basically, you, you, your um, digital image stabilization, you, know, you do the crop around the edges and then you move the crop and you do like pixel by pixel identification of, you know. well, they're not doing that. That's their second pass. Their first pass is just, how did the phone actually, you know, wriggle or jiggle or whatever when the person was holding it to take this video and how do I compensate for that? Now, that's doing it in real time. It's doing it in real time on the device. You want really, really, really high performance code there, which means you're probably going to write it in C++ with an Objective-C shim over the top of it, and your core image processing is as close to the hardware as you can get. If you've got hardware, hardware accelerated instruction sets, you will use those. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way as the uh, Microsoft uh, Photosynth app that came out a couple of years ago. Again, really, really cool. It's doing lots and lots of heavy lifting on the device itself. It's doing some very severe math on the device itself. because um, So this one's cool because it does image stabilization. The, um, the, uh, the Photosynth one, has anyone used it? You really should get it. It's very, very cool. Um, it uses your phone's gyroscope plus compass. And what you can do is you can just click, 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 and it will take into account the phone's orientation, and it will actually build you a scrollable, almost navigable image of, as in a 360 degree by 360 degree map of around yourself. And it does that all on the device. If you're holding your device, when you actually hit the save and you know, make this rendered button, you'll feel it get pretty warm. <laughs> 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 Your phone will get hot. Right? It's burning a lot of battery. It's spinning a lot of CPU. You don't want to write that in JavaScript. Okay? So you want that to be native. How cheap was that to build? Though? Who wants to build that as their very first app ever and sink you know, several hundred thousand to several million dollars on it just on a maybe? Yeah. And with that, thank you, everyone. So I'll throw the floor over, open to, to questions, and then I'll call Sven up to say a quick thanks and goodbye. But firstly, questions from anyone? Yes, would please. Would you target Windows Phone? I would because I like Windows Phone. Um, the, the device quality that... It, it's really frustrating that Microsoft was such a late mover in this market because the devices are astounding. Even the cheapy, crappy ones that you get from like Big W for 50 bucks or whatever, they're really nice. The form factor is nice. The build quality is good. It's a nice user experience. And if they'd been second mover um, as opposed to, to Android, wow, um, their market share would have been huge. So um, I would. With the cross-platform tools, it's approaching free. 
the incremental cost to target Windows Phone is actually really pretty low. So I would do that even if your primary targets were iOS, for instance, iOS, Android, whatever, I'd do it for Windows Phone just because, well, why not? Um, and then you'll, you'll actually get to the point where you look at Windows Phone, it's this is actually pretty nice. If we could make this the first class citizen, then the others would actually have a few bits of catching up to do. So I would. If I were to target the three, though, then all other things being equal for a line of business app, it's going to be a hybrid HTML you know, app container using Cordova. So it's pretty free. But does that answer the question? Yeah. Oh, well, yes? What experience have you had with outsourcing um, this? Uh, <laughs> standard approach? Yes, the, so that's, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, Mobile apps, so the problems that you run into with outsourcing are very much it is a defined chunk of work. That means that the better you can define a thing, the more likely you are to get a good outcome. Mobile apps in the past tended to be very simple. One feature, do it well, that's fine, which means it was very simple to encapsulate that in some kind of requirements, tender, whatever document to, to outsource it. What you tend to find, though, is that if your app is not particularly successful, you probably only keep one or two features, so it's fine. But if your app does become successful, then people want more and more features. And that means you then have to tack more and more on to something that probably wasn't designed for that well enough in advance. So then what you end up with is this application that you know, some poor group of people somewhere is just being asked to tack random things onto it, and they're never actually given the opportunity to say, look, we can do this, but we need to take a step back and do some rework. You know, we need to do some redesign. Because you tend to price just that feature, when the reality is you need to price feature plus rework to actually make it happen. So if you are very, very confident that your app is only ever going to do a very small handful of things, by all means, give it some thought. Um, treat that as, a, as an investment that you're prepared to lose, though. Uh, because if you don't get what you were after, then you're going to have to go back and pretty much do the entire lot again. You know, tweaks in here, here or there. But by and large, if you take one look at the thing and go, this is horrible, well, you can either not pay and everybody can sue each other, or you know, you're effectively paying over and over again. So with your more complex line of business apps, I would look, rather than um, outsourcing, I, I would look at off the shelf if you can. Um, because off the shelf, you can already download the thing from an app marketplace or whatever, and you can play with it and see what it, if it does what you want. But if you're actually going to have proper line of business, then what you're really doing there is you're putting your custom logic into a lot of these apps. And that's going to grow and evolve over time, which means much more than outsourcing for a, for a fixed price or a, you know, a, a limited risk sort of scenario, what you really care about is your long-term maintainability, which means you want to be able to do this in-house because you want the people who are doing the work to be able to, one, gain and keep an understanding of your business rules, and two, have open lines of communications to the people who need to clarify them. So line of business, do it in-house or do it with a partner who will then leave you self-sufficient. Uh, but probably, you know, if you look at outsourcing, do it for very, very simple things. Treat it as a, you know, as a possible just disposable you know, investment that, that doesn't actually retain anything. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Right, thank you. One, and then two, and then I think we're... Um, right. but, um, don't be too simply ignorant here, but um, the hybrid mm -hmm. approach is not that great when you make it more about how sort of work, what sort of technology software you use to develop I, those sort of... I, I can. Um, what I'll probably I'll give a, a thirty second overview here, and then hit me up afterwards if you have a few minutes, and I'll go through a little bit more technical detail. But uh, at the high level, basically, you're writing a, an HTML and JavaScript application, um, and you want to put that. Think of it as a zip file. So basically, you zip it up and bring it into a package somewhere. Separate to that, what you do is you write a native app for each device, and that native app is basically an iframe. So on iOS, it's a UI web view that just points Safari, so it points WebKit at your zipped bundle of HTML and JavaScript. Likewise for Android, likewise for, for Windows Phone. Um, there's a tool suite that does, well, there's, I guess the, 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 the key component that does that is called Apache Cordova, which is an open source, um, it's PhoneGap, basically. Um, but you know, Cordova is the open source version. PhoneGap is the Adobe proprietary version of that. So what that does for you is 
automate the, okay, I've got HTML and JavaScript code here, bung it into an app container for me. So it will actually build you that app container. So that's basic. When we're talking about hybrid applications, that's kind of how they work. Obviously, you then have to work out how to expose device functionality and all those sorts of things underneath. So hit me up afterwards for, for how to do that. But, um, but yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's effectively what you're doing. It's a website in an iframe in an app. Does that make sense? And last one? Yes. Do you see that as becoming more, I guess, stronger or, or less prevalent amongst the various platforms? That's, that's a hard question to answer, um, largely because of Apple. Microsoft has generally been very consistent about it, and it's not been hard to get your apps. You know, basically, if you violate these guidelines, then no, uh, and we'll automate that. And we, like Microsoft will give you the compliance tool. Like Microsoft will say to you, hey, look, um, see this tool here? You should run it on your app, because what we're going to do is run that tool on your app, and it will tell you what the answer is going to be. Um, Google had a pretty much free-for-all approach. They're now starting to pull that back a little bit. Apple was always the capricious child of App Store approval. You know, no, you can't have cross-compiled. Oh, actually, yes, you may. Uh, but, right? or no web apps that just wrap a, or so you know, UI web views that just wrap this out. Now they're in. Now they're a maybe. Um, and Apple's also one of the more difficult ones just to predict in terms of time. So um, you, you need to, to budget for that in your project time. So I think at the moment, average App Store approval for Apple is about nine days for a new app, and then about two for an update. Um, the others. Pretty much you're always waiting for Apple. So yeah, bear that in mind. That said, there are lots and lots and lots of hybrid apps in the App Store. Apple doesn't have an issue with hybrid apps. Um, they just, yeah, they may change their mind at any point. They, they have issues with, you know, you're not allowed to jet on a device, um, and you're not allowed to, basically, you, you have to add something. It can't just be a website. Yeah. So you have to add something. There has to be some kind of you know, appiness about it. The problem there is that how do you define that? Um, and that's where it gets very, very blurry. So yeah, does that yeah. at least help answer the question? Yeah. Okay, right. look, Thank uh, you all. Andrew and I are going to sort of hang around for another, you know, 10, 15 minutes. So feel free to come down and chat to us and coffee outside. Um, just before everyone goes, we will be emailing you a feedback form. Um, so if you kindly fill that out for us, um, you know, we want to improve these events and, and make them as relevant as possible to you. So uh, uh, take a minute. And I'll leave some of my cards uh, just on the desk outside. So uh, if you want to sort of contact me later and, and put any questions or want to get back to Redify, please, um, please take a card and give us a call. So, yeah. A really quick question. Sure. Is there a link to the slideshow? That will come out as part of your the email. The email, yes. Okay. Yeah. yes. It will be on um, SlideShare at some point fairly yeah. soon, so there'll be a link to that in the yeah. page to the PDF. Okay. Thanks very right. much. Cool. Thanks, everyone.